Welcome to Beneath the Wing. Just like air passing over the wing of an aircraft provides lift, the people we meet can also give us lift in life by sharing their stories of strength and success, connecting us all. Beneath the Wing explores the stories of those connected with the Minnesota Air National Guard's 133rd Airlift Wing with a little humor and learning along the way. I'm your host, Wing Command Chief, Mark Legfold. Joining me today on Beneath the Wing is Lieutenant Becca Fleming. Lieutenant Fleming started her in, career enlisting uh, as one of our aircraft maintainers in 2012. You're going to stop me if I get any of this wrong. Uh, you started out in one of their electrical shops, and you filled in for a little bit as one of the engine repair workers. After finishing her college degree, she decided to apply for and was accepted as one of our navigators on our C-130s, commissioning into our century-old 109th Airlift Squadron. She's also one of our traditional Guard members, uh, which means she balances a full-time civilian career with her military service. Lieutenant, welcome to Beneath the Wing. Thank you. We're going to have some fun. Yeah, glad to be here. Uh, let's start with the obvious question, okay? What does a nav really do? Can't you just use Google Maps on those things and get where you're going? A lot of people ask that question. And more, a lot of our job happens before we actually step to the plane, mission planning, looking at the weather, making sure our routing is perfect. And then, of course, our job is to airdrop, make sure we have um, the winds correct and get the cargo to where the Army guys on the ground Need it. So if I never threw a uniform on and I didn't really know what our planes did, when you say airdrop, you're not actually dropping oxygen out. How, what is an airdrop? An airdrop. Okay, so we, um, we're we able to drop um, cargo, uh, vehicles. We also have guys that like to jump out of our airplanes to get into an objective area. Um, and so we open up our ramp and door, and we have a spot on the ground that we intend for them to land. And the job as the navigator is to tell them when to jump or when to release the cargo so that it lands on the intended spot. That sounds like it's a lot of, like you said, it's a lot of planning and a lot of work. How do you know when to actually do that? What are the variables that go in to figuring that out? Yeah, so figuring that out, we are determining that based on our airspeed as an aircraft, what the winds are at the altitude that we're dropping at, and then also the winds on the surface, as well as the weight um, and the ballistics of the parachute and the cargo that we're dropping or the guys we're jump that are jumping out. And that's kind of your grade is how close you get to target. That's right. That's so, right. So are you a good navigator? Um, I am a baby navigator learning a lot still and hope to be a good navigator someday. What does it take to be a good navigator? I think you have to be humble and accept, um, accept input from all of your crew. We're a crew airplane for a reason. So to be a good navigator, you need input and help from the pilots and the engineers and the loadmasters. Um, to get our airdrop where it needs to go. So it's a big team. It's a team. Effort. Yes. Um, you, you've you worked with a lot of teams and you've worked with a lot of people, so learning how people work together. Um, how did you get here? What was the appeal to get into the Air National Guard? And how did you go from a little suburb, little suburb, of the Twin Cities, just south of the Twin Cities, to here? Yeah, so um, I'll start with the day I enlisted. It was the morning after my senior prom. I got my butt up and came to enlist. Um, but prior to that, uh, my grandfather was in the Army, a paratrooper. I have several aunts and uncles that were also in the Army. So the conversation came up about me it was very late in my high school career that I was thinking about the military. My plans to play soccer in college didn't quite pan out, which is okay. Um, but my aunts and uncles told me that if I wanted to be in the military, I should join the Air Force because I would get three hot meals and a cot 
And maybe I'd pack a sleeping bag, but I'd never have to use it. <laughs> and so... Your aunt and uncle were very accurate in that assessment of the Air Force. They continue to tell me that to this day. And so um, I found out through a friend's father who used to be a pilot out here that the Air National Guard existed. I always heard about the Army Guard and never the Air Guard. And so morning after my senior prom, I ended up here enlisting. Did you know what you were going to be when you enlisted? Did you know what your job was going to be? I did. And um, at the time, Master Sergeant Heath Troop really sold, sold the maintenance electrician job. And so that's what I chose. Right on. Yeah. Did you bring your prom date to the enlistment or? No, my prom date enlisted in the Marines and the Marine Reserve across the street. So. I would say you made the smarter choice. Yes. No offense to my recovering Marines or current Marines that are listening, but good choice. So you joined, you enlisted, um, but you also went to college right after high school, didn't you? I did. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Tell us about that path. Okay. Um, so I went to Bemidji State for a couple years. Go Beavers. Go Beavers. Mm -hmm. Loved it up there. Um, then halfway through my, uh, I think, second year up there, I decided to go to South Dakota State. So I got into the Egg College of Egg down there and enjoyed going to rodeos, being in proxy council, all the little international Egg, school of egg stuff. Did you grow up a farm kid? I grew up going to my grandpa's farm, oh. but not in the suburbs of Rosemount. We Got did. it. Okay. We had horses, but they were not at our property. Understood. Mm -hmm. Okay, so off to South Dakota after Bemidji. Yep. True story about Bemidji. Tell me if this is true. Does Bemidji have more parking spaces on campus during the winter or the summer months? The winter months. How does that work? So the lake comes up directly to the campus. And so when it freezes over, we can park our fish houses out there and our vehicles on the lake. They actually have roads from the other side of the lake to the campus, which is wonderful. And the campus has its own fish houses. That's correct. That's awesome. Yes. Okay. But you left all that behind and went out to South Dakota. I did. And the suburb kid majored in what agricultural field? They call it egg systems technology. Did that marry up with the electrical shop that you were working with? Yes. Is it, that why you got into that? Well, actually, um, first failure in my college career was calculus. And they told me I could not be an engineer if I couldn't pass calculus. And so they said there's another option that a lot of folks are going into, which is egg systems technology, which is much cooler because it's precision egg. It's all about wiring and getting the most yield out of the acre, making the farmers profit. And which is important. In it is important. Yes. We'll, we'll we'll go on to that a little bit a little bit further. So somewhere in here you graduated from South Dakota, mm -hmm. but you are also serving in the military. That's right. How did you balance all of that? Um, well, I, I was gone a lot of weekends um, to come back, especially drill weekends. And then I just took a lot of communication with um, my professors and with um, the unit here to make sure that I was giving my best to both, which is difficult to miss your homecoming every year because it falls on drill weekend and to have to take your finals early because you're going to Antarctica or um, some of the other challenges were um, being on a TDY, say to Yuma, Arizona, where we go every year and having to um, take uh, take tests remotely and find find somebody else who was able to proctor your test while you're in Yuma. Um, but I think a lot of it was communication, and if you're upfront with your professors beforehand, um, 
they're pretty understanding. A TDY, just in case somebody doesn't know what that is, is like a temporary trip we go someplace for a training or a mission, right? Yes. So you would do a final exam or be writing a paper out in a deployed place. That's correct. Normally a hotel with a bed and three hot meals, right? That's like correct. Your, like your aunt and uncle said. You balanced it. Yes. But still really hard. It was. Yep. Did that have an impact on how you learned how to work with a team of people, or did it negative or positive, I guess? Um, I guess it was it was hard at the time, but positively, um, the way that I've grown from having to do that is to continue to make those connections and relationships, even if I'm not um, in the shop or on the base throughout the month. Um, but still keeping up with what's going on back here on base day to day. Because I don't think a lot of people realize that there are full-timers out on the base, and there are planes that are flying every yeah, day out here. Almost every day, yep. That's right. And so it's not just when I come in on a drill weekend that work is being done. And so keeping up with what's going on in the base throughout the month is important. Um, and so checking back in, I think, has helped be a better part of the team. What's something that you could teach people like me at the end of their career, close to the end, and you're like sort of in the middle or early middle, we'll just call it, of your career, uh, about staying connected with the people at the wing. You mentioned that the relationships are important out here. Mm -hmm. What can we do well as an organization or even better to keep our folks connected? Yeah, I um, I think the wing has done a great job um, keeping up with, I mean, my generation is always on Facebook or Instagram, and we have some great folks that keep up with what's going on, what our other units around the base are doing. Um, so that's been great. Um, as far as on a smaller scale within within your specific team, your shop, um, I think leadership has done a pretty good job and continue can continue to do better reaching out during the month when you're not seeing your members. Mm -hmm. Okay. So speaking of staying connected, you don't live near here anymore. It's about an hour and 10 minute commute yep. into the base. Yep. From Wisconsin now. Maiden Rock, Wisconsin. Maiden Rock, Wisconsin. So you've gone from Rosemont, little suburb, just south of the Twin Cities, all the way up north to Bemidji, where they have a bigger parking lot in the wintertime, mm -hmm. to South Dakota, yes. and now live in Maiden Rock. Why Maiden Rock? Maiden Rock. So um, my husband and I lived in, before we were married, we lived in Red Wing, where he grew up for a couple years. And then we had gone to visit his brother um, to put our kayaks in the Rush River. And we drove by this little 10-acre farm, you know, every summer, every weekend in the summer. And I said, someday we're going to buy that house and raise babies in it. And um, sure enough, it came for sale on a horse Facebook page. And so we ended up buying, buying that farm. Well, congratulations. How long has it been now in that house? Four years. Wow. So you're well settled in there. Well, I've been gone for two and a half years for training, but my husband has settled us in there well. That's great. He's, he's a good military spouse then. He is. Great. Yes. Um, does he work in military or agriculture? Um, he is a union insulator. A union insulator? Yes. What does a union insulator do? So they he works um, either in nuclear power plants or even schools, um, insulating hot water, cold water pipes. Um, that's about the extent I know. Awesome. I'm sure that is busy. Balancing both a military career and a civilian career and a very, very busy life for him too, and a farm. It takes a lot. Are you still working in agriculture? Um, I Once I'm done with my, um, we'll call it on-the-job training here on base, yeah. Um, next week I will start working for a company called CHS. They're a 
global agribusiness, and I'll be in their energy division. So Senex Harvest States. That's correct. And you're going to work in their energy division. Yes. All right. So one of the interesting facts about where you went to school is they built the first ethanol plant on campus. Did you know that? No. Yes. So at the University of South Dakota, sorry, yes, University of South Dakota, go Jackrabbits, first ethanol plant on a college campus so that they could study that. Are you going to be working on ethanol production? No. Okay, their energy division. Explain yes. what an agricultural company does with, with regard to energy. Yes, so in regard to energy, um, I'll go through the seasons because that seems to make the most sense. So in the springtime, you have planting season. So tractors need fuel, semi-trucks need fuel. Um, and so that's part of what we do is we move fuel from a terminal to out to the farm or out to a co-op. And then um, into the springtime, or into the summer, the sprayers need fuel, um, the trucks need fuel, and then into the harvest time in the fall, a lot of um, folks around here will harvest grain before it's dry. And so there's grain dryers that will need propane. Um, and so also we'll move propane throughout the region so right. that grain can be dried. It's a lot of logistics. It is, yes. So you're going from dropping cargo out of a back of a plane, yes. which is a lot of logistics work, True. to dropping a lot of fuel out for farmers to keep people fed. Yes. Well, it all ties in together nicely, doesn't it? It does. How long have you worked for CHS? You said you're starting this job. Yes. Have you been with them longer than next week? No. This will be, I worked for a local co-op prior to um, being a navigator, and now I'm moving on to work for CHS. Sounds sounds like a great transition. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about, well, you, it's nice out here because you never have to worry about what to wear. True. It's a little bit different working for a company, isn't it? True. Yeah. Um, so the 109th, let's get back to the back to the airplanes. The 109th just um, is is our airlift squadron. Uh, they started out as the 109th Observation Squadron, but it's a part of the 133rd Airlift Wing, which is where we're sitting. It's celebrating its 101st anniversary of its existence. Um, in fact, it just gained mention this past weekend by the Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force on her social media page. Uh, so thanks to Chief Bass for that. What's special to you to be a part of this storied and historic organization? What is special to me? Um, I guess I see a lot of um, families that are out here at the wing. Um, and so you see, you see a chief master sergeant that has the same last name as a senior airman, and there really are threads of families or extended families. And um, I'm the first of my family to um, be in the Air National Guard. And so I guess that is special for me, and I hope that I will have Flemings um, coming through this base after me as well. You you speak to that as if this is a good place for people to bring their kids. Why is it that way? If I were if I were just a business executive, if I was a administrator for a CHS and I wanted to have this kind of place where people wanted their kids to work, how do you do that? How do you do that? I know you've been with us for 10 years. <laughs> I have. So you've been able to study the teamwork that we do out here. What makes mm -hmm. it a special place? Yeah. Well, I think we, um, if you've spent any time at Starbase, you've seen the amount of kids that we're able to um, touch and teach, um, touch through like science and um, building rockets and getting excited about aviation. Um, and I think we just, we just do carry the core values through. Um, through the people that were able to reach out here. Explain Starbase program to us and how are you involved in that? Okay, so Starbase, um, and I will say I've taken a hiatus now that I've gone to training and come back. Um, but Starbase um, 
allows kids to come out and they we have a building specifically for them. They learn about, a lot about science, technology, engineering, and math, of course. The and STEM fields. The STEM fields. Yeah. Um, and they learn about the airplanes we have here, the C-130s. And then towards the end is where I was able to volunteer several times is when they build a rocket. And we go out to the ball field, and the kids are able to watch their rockets launch and then parachute back down. So you worked with the kids, normally about fourth or fifth grade age, right? True. Where do we get these kids? You know? Where do they come from? Where do they come from? I, From my understanding, they come from the Twin Cities area. Okay. Yeah. Which is basically where we're based. So bust the kids in and it's yeah. it really is a great, is it a one week or a two week program? Yeah, I think one week, yeah. four or five days. How did you get interested in doing that out here? Um, well, a lot of things around here, the first time you get voluntold. So voluntold is a word we use fondly mm -hmm. around here where, ah, man, we need somebody to do it, and so you're appointed. But then once you actually see the kids that we're serving um, and get to help them build rockets and see the excitement when you're counting down to their rocket launching, you end up going back. What has working with kids and teaching them a little bit after being voluntold, what has that experience taught you about leading and working with people in the workplace? It's hmm. a good question. Um, not sure. Really? Yeah. All right. I guess, I guess kids have different personalities just like everybody else does, every, every adult does. And so figuring out what is important and what is the priority of each individual child is um, similar to when you're working with a team out here. You figure out what is important and prior, a priority for your team member and I feel like you can better serve each other that way. Yeah. It also helps with our family atmosphere that we have out here, isn't it? True. Not that I would encourage people to treat everybody out here in the military environment like their children, but we sure do learn a lot uh, when we work with kids uh, that we can bring into leading in an organization. Thank you for taking a moment and just thinking about that one for a little while. Um, we're rounding out March. Mm -hmm. March is Women's History Month. You know this, though, don't you? So I'm just going to call you young. You're a young woman in a still male-dominated field. You worked in maintenance, which is super male-dominated. Dom um, you work in our flying and operations squadron, still pretty male-dominated field, and agriculture, mm -hmm. a bunch of old farmers, right? Yes. Um, what advice would you give a young woman who's looking to break barriers in their field? Since you've worked in three fields and currently work in three fields and are breaking some really good barriers. What advice do you have? Yeah, advice that I would have. Um, and this advice comes from ex experience. Like you said, I, I think you will gain respect and be respected if you come into a field and have confidence in what you do know and are humble about the things that you don't know. Um, I also have found that it is important to find a mentor that either male or female, um, but a mentor that can also teach you um, those things that you maybe don't know. Um, yeah. Yes. So who's yours? Who is mine? Or better um, yet, if you don't want to name your mentor, because you probably have more than one, what are the characteristics you look for in somebody that's going to be your mentor? Um, I think patience and honesty. Also, there are, there are great people who are good at their jobs, but as far as their ability to teach, there are people who are 
better able to teach and some who are just really good at doing the job. So I think that's important as well, finding somebody who has the time and capacity to teach. Rounding you right back to that Starbase question, right? <laughs> yes. If you can work with kids and you learn how to teach, mm -hmm. um, you probably are going to be a pretty good mentor and a role model. Um, but you, you mentioned male or female. Mm -hmm. um, is it important to have female mentors and role models in the workplace for a young woman that is looking to break barriers? Yeah, I think depending on the team and the organization you're with, you may be the female and um, or the females that are around before you maybe, like I said, don't have the capacity to be the mentor that you are seeking. Um, but it is important to make those connections, um, whether it's laterally um, in your field or women that are following you in the field as well. I think that's really important. Yes. Okay. So knowing that we are, we're moving in, I think, the right direction when it comes to having a a good degree of highly capable, confident um, women in leadership positions. Are we getting inclusion inclusion right in the military from your perspective? From my perspective, we are. Um, I just... I think going forward, the military needs to make sure that we are still holding the same standards for every gender, every race that we are, um, everybody that is asked to do a job. So as long as all the standards are the same, even though we look different, um, I think that's the important part. Okay. Um, so... Who's your big role model? When you when you came in, I, you mentioned your aunt and uncle. Mm -hmm. uh, your aunt served. Yes. Your uncle served. Yes. Your grandpa served. Yes. Um, what did your aunt specifically tell you about joining the military? Um, and is she, I'm sorry, back to the original question, is she your, your big role model in this? She, she served in the military for, in the Army Guard for a very short time. Okay. And so she, um, she is a role model for reasons outside of military service, Okay, for sure, yes. All right. Um, so you mentioned your failure in calculus. Going way back to this, I take a couple notes here, Lieutenant, while we're going through this. Okay. What did you learn about moving forward through that failure? I mean, I'm not a math guy either, but you're a navigator. Mm -hmm. I guess that's a lot of math, and it's not just Google Maps. So what did you learn about um, how to succeed from that failure? What did that teach you? You're right. Being a navigator is a lot of math, and it's a lot of um, time and distance math, which is difficult. Um, and so from that failure, I have learned that being humble about the things you don't know is important and asking the questions and not avoiding the things you don't know is really important as well. It's easy to study the things that you remember um, off the top of your head but really finding what your weaknesses are and then trying to, sounds cheesy, but trying to make those a strength of yours learning them well enough to be able to teach them because we you will have that hole in your in your skill set until you attack it head on you must be better at math now i i'm learning to be better at <laughs> math now and calculus is just it's hard yes it's hard stuff okay um We've been talking with Lieutenant Becca Fleming, and we're going to take a little bit of break um, and hear from our uh, retention manager about cross-training, something you are very familiar with. And as soon as we're done with that, we're going to come right back. So please stick around for our second part. Hi, this is Jeff Sprick with the 133rd Airlift Wing Retention Office. As you get closer to your separation date, 
there are a lot of things to consider. One thing I'd ask you to consider is cross training. Come talk to me. Give me a call. 612-713-2032. And we can talk about cross training opportunities. We have a state cross training bonus of $10,000. A state reenlistment bonus for $15,000. And a federal reenlistment bonus of $20,000 or $15,000. A lot of opportunities. Please reach out to me so you can get good information before you make a decision. Thanks. 612-713-2032. Thanks for sticking around for the second half of Beneath the Wing, and thanks to Sergeant Sprick for that great commercial message. I'm sitting here with Lieutenant Becca Fleming of the 109th Airlift Squadron, a part of the 133rd Airlift Wing here in St. Paul, Minnesota. And during the break, you and I got a chance to sit here and talk, and we talked a little bit about agriculture and farming and where your grandpa's farm was. So we talked about it in the first section. Where's Where was grandpa's farm? Just north of Worthington, Minnesota. And where is that in the state of Minnesota? Southwest Minnesota. Southwest. That is a special place if you grow crops. What's so special about that? neck of the woods the black dirt the black dirt nice deep fertile soil that's right is your grandpa still farming that no he is not okay he has since passed away and now his sons my uncles farm it together do you still get out there yes we are out there um, at least a couple times a year to help butcher um, not as much as we used to you know i used to spend spring breaks helping my grandpa pull calves. And so now we're just out there during harvest and then a couple times a year to help butcher. Okay, when you say help butcher, now I grew up on a farm and I grew up raising cattle. And to me, helping butcher was loading them in a trailer and taking them to the meat market so that the meat market can make steaks. Is that what you mean? Prior to 2020, that is, Yes, what we would do. Um, and so now we actually just kill the cattle or the hogs right out in the front yard and then pull the skin off and bring them into the cooler that we've built in the old horse barn. What happened in 2020 where that you had to do that? So a lot of the lockers um, and butchers were not able to keep up with the amount of cattle, and especially when Smithfield Pork in Sioux Falls had a huge outbreak of COVID. They had to shut down, and unfortunately, a lot of producers had to just kill full barns of pigs. So during that time, we decided to just set up our own in our old horse barn at my grandpa's farm. And we got a patient lift, like for from a hospital, to lift the meat up and let it hang for a certain number of days and let it freeze and then cut it up and fill our freezers. That is old-time farming right there. It's great. Who taught you how to do that? Well, we have a lot of hunters in our family. And so similar to when you harvest a deer and cut up the meat... It's, I mean, it's similar, similar to that. So you knew how to do that before the, before you guys opened up your own meat market? I will say that I certainly was not the expert, but my uncles, my husband and brother-in-law, yes. Are you guys still doing that? Yes. There are five hogs to be butchered this weekend. And you're going to go and do that? Yes. An accomplished butcher and a navigator and now an energy manager for a big agricultural company. Impressive. Um, on top of raising cows and pigs, mm -hmm. uh, the farm also does field work. That's and right. You went to SDSU and mm -hmm. majored in... Um, ag Systems Technology. Ag Systems Technology. So what does Ag Systems te Technology really mean? To somebody that goes to the grocery store and buys their food, why is that? Isn't farming just 
plowing the ground and putting a seed in it and it'll grow and then you harvest it and we eat. Um, what's, what's technology got to do with farming? Yeah, so a big buzzword these days would be precision agriculture. So using technology to figure out the makeup of each acre of soil and then using your inputs appropriately to produce the most amount of corn or soybeans out of each acre. The other, the other thing that is included in that would be, say you have really poor acres of soil. You don't pour money into the acres that don't produce well, and you save your inputs for the acres of soil that do produce well. So for, the, for a grower, a farmer, or a producer, they would be increasing their profits per acre as well as increasing the amount of corn, soybeans they can get out of each field. So it's about efficiencies. True. Okay. And if you're not putting a lot of, you say inputs. Now I kind of know what inputs mean because I may or may not have the habit of farming. Um, not, note I didn't say hobby, just the habit. Uh, what's an input when it comes to farmers and farming? Yeah, so inputs could be um, fertilizer. It could be um, some sort of chemical or weed protection, insect protection. Um, it could also be natural inputs. So the amount, of, this is maybe a little unconventional, me talking about inputs as far as the amount of sunlight and water, things we can't control that each field gets. However, there are farms that do have irrigation, and so you could consider water an input as well. Anything that costs money that you have to throw at a seed to make it grow. That's right. Could be pretty much an input. Yep. Doing that efficiently is good for the farmers. Yes. Good for the people at the grocery store. Good for the people at the grocery store. Why? Um, if we're able to produce more corn, more soybeans, um, they're sort of get into economics. You have an abundance of supply, which makes the grocery store prices cheaper. Which we're all in favor of. In theory, yep. yes. Okay. What do you think the future of farming looks like? Ah, this is an interesting question. Because personally, on our small farm that we're starting to build, um, I see folks like myself bringing agriculture on a smaller scale to the home where we have a garden and we have a cow-calf pair in the field. And I, I think as far as the community that I'm in, I feel like that is important. Um, now, there are folks who don't live in communities like I do and rely on farms that are larger to um, produce corn, not only for food inputs, but for feed and for ethanol production. And so I think you're going to see a mix of folks who are learning to farm and bring it on their own home place, and then bigger farms that are also going to produce world need what the world needs. Okay. So back to our military jobs. Yes. But we'll mix it all together. A lot of uh, statements out there um, regarding this new term that we have called a multi-capable airman. Now, I, I have my hypothesis about what a multi-capable airman is. It's basically a person that we can deploy that can do a ton of different jobs. Mm -hmm. So if I had the chance to talk to the senior leaders of the Air Force, if, if I wanted to have a multi-capable airman, could I just get a bunch of farm kids with some baler wire and a mismatched set of tools and some axle grease and bring them on a deployment? Um, they could literally butcher their own cattle. They could. They could provide for everybody. That's an interesting question. I would say yes. I believe in the in the American farm kid that could. However, there are a few skills that they would have to learn that are specifically related to the airplane. It would take a while to teach one how to be a navigator, right? But they could teach us, and we could teach them, and multi-capable. There you go. 
Um, okay, so second half of the podcast, we always have a little bit of more, little bit of fun. Okay. Seriously, we could talk farming all day too. Yes. Uh, quick questions. You ready for this? Yes, I am ready. Now that you live in Wisconsin, best beer in Wisconsin. Spotted cow. Hands down. Type of cheese you would most likely name your dog after. Cheese curds. I'd name my dog Curd. Good. Uh, guilty pleasure TV show. Friends. That's old school. Jackrabbits, gophers, or beavers? Go Jacks. All right. Taylor Swift, Kesha, Katy Perry, or Nicki Minaj? Taylor Swift. You're going to regret that answer when you get back down to ops. Would you rather smell horse manure or jet A fuel? <laughs> um, horse manure. Okay. Um, back to that. Horses or cattle, which would you rather work with? Horses. Okay. All right, so uh, graduate, good job on the, uh, the, the short answer and definitely uh, spotted cow. Um, I mentioned you went to South Dakota State. Another distinguished graduate of South Dakota State University is Stephen Foster Briggs. Yeah, you're searching your memory banks. That's okay. He wasn't there when you were because he was there in 1907. Um, he invented something. So, Briggs. yeah. Briggs. There was a building named after him. I'll bet there was because Mr. Briggs and Stratton built this little engine, right, on campus. So you and this other innovator in the world, Stephen Foster Briggs, are enjoying a spotted cow uh, talking about innovation and what the past 120 years has looked like since he designed that first Briggs and Stratton engine. And you're both trying to come up with what's going to come up in the next 100 years. What do you think is going to be the biggest thing that comes up in the next 100 years oh. when it comes to innovation? When it comes to I think they're going to try to make cars fly. I can't wait. I don't know. Airspace is scary already. Well, spoken like a true nav, right? <laughs> um, but I, I sure would like to see the flying car. That would be so much fun. Um, speaking of somebody that's spent his entire Air Force career with his boots on the ground, um, can you explain what Hobo Days is? Speaking of S-D-E-S-U. Yes. Um, like I said, I normally had drill during hobo days, so I missed most of them. However, I did get there my senior year. Hobo days is homecoming for SDSU, and during the week, there's lots of events. We dress like hobos. We go to the local. Locals have signs out in their front yards where you can stop and get a meal. Um, they will serve the college kids meals, and we have a hobo day parade. And everybody's just dressed like a hobo. That's their thing. That's good. That's one of the fun things about being here in flyover country or the Midwest is every little town has their own little festival. Mm -hmm. What's the big festival in Maiden Rock? Um, we just call it maple syrup season. There's not really a big festival. We Sounds so Midwestern. <laughs> maple syrup season. It does sound good. Okay. Um, my wife and I actually took a little, uh, we'll call it a COVID vacation, where we went and we just stayed by ourselves, but we went to a place close by and did some bicycling and uh, did some trips, and we went to Maiden Rock. Really? Do you know the story of Maiden Rock? I do. It's an unfortunate one. Okay. I can let you tell it. And I'm sure you, you're the resident, so I'll let you. The... So you can fill in the holes because the really what I know is that this poor woman lost her husband and she actually jumped from one of the bluffs that were in Maiden Rock. Do you have 
Can you fill you're, in? Yeah, the you're holes? you're right up there. From what I read, that's uh, really true. Native American, um, and they're it's kind of like a Native American Romeo and Juliet story where they wouldn't let them marry, and so he jumped off the cliff first, and then she was so heartbroken that she did too. Now you filled in the holes for there, me. There you go. Um, so small little town. I, I I think it's 170 people that are in the Maiden Rock area. That's correct. Uh, lots of beautiful bluffs and mm -hmm. all kinds of, it's just a great spot. So I would recommend people go and visit Maiden Rock, Wisconsin. Maybe you'll find a horse farm that goes there at, or that's uh, in that neck of the woods. The maple syrup at least. For sure. Yes. For sure. Um, so you've been in the military for about 10 years. You've done a ton of stuff. Mm -hmm. What are you most looking forward to for the remainder of your career? And what, what are you most hopeful for? Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward to deploying as a navigator. Um, and also hopeful that um, I can continue moving up in my career. And like we talked about, just being able to learn my job well enough that I'm confident to teach the folks that are coming behind me. All right. Lieutenant Becca Fleming, thanks for joining me on this episode of Beneath the Wing. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. And for those of you that uh, kept on listening all the way to the end here, I hope that you join me for the next episode of Beneath the Wing where we're going to feature one of our Airmen of the Year winners uh, who just got back from deployment and uh, won the state competition in our Airman of the Year. So he'll be joining me on the next one. Thanks, Lieutenant. We really enjoyed the chat. Thanks.